Welcome in everyone to my channel. Um, this is a time lapse, kind of a not so fast, but a little bit sped up um, drawing that I did from a muse on the Sketchy app, and I will link out that app in the description below because it's a fabulous app where you can find all sorts of muses and people to draw and paint from. I'm just showing you the materials I'm using in this drawing, uh, which are the Derwent Graphitant series, and they are water soluble. I originally thought I was going to use these three different colors, but I ended up just using one of them, uh, which was the sort of like the mid-tone green one. Um, these are these little sponges that I use for blending, and you can use those with pastels also. Those are actually they're called soft tools, and they um, typically get used with pan pastels, but they work great with uh, blending pencil products, even regular graphite. So here I am just figuring out the lighting and which is going to be best for the recording. So here I'm starting to look at the um, putting in the darker values. I thought since I was going to originally use three of the pencils, I thought that I would block in the darker values first, uh, which is what I would typically do anyways, like with a painting for sure, like with opaque mediums, I would definitely be doing that, and also with my pastels. But as you'll see later on, I just decide to kind of leave it more monochrome and just use this. It's like a really nice soft forest green, um, a little bit on the bluish side of the family so I just decided that I really like the way that that one color was by itself so I just kept with that one green color so yeah here I am just adding in the eyebrow and then just taking a look at where I want to you know add in this this color I mean since now I've decided that it's going to be just this one color then there's not not too many crazy details required it's more just you know looking for the shadow and finding out and deciding you know where I want to apply more pressure um, or or not so much pressure I mean and that's essentially how you're gonna get the darker values when you're using like a graphite um, pencil such as this okay so continuing to add in uh, right at the bridge of her nose was a pretty strong um, dark shadow so that's why that looks really outlined right now it'll it'll mix into the rest of the drawing later um, but yeah, she had a really bright um, lighting source coming from the right side on the right side of her face. You probably saw that um, at the start. So usually with lips like the, so she has like a sort of a partly open mouth and inside that section is going to be very dark. Also, usually right at the break of, like in between the lips, if the mouth is closed, usually the corners of the mouth are the darkest parts. And the typically the upper lip is darker than the lower lip because the lower lip kind of extends out a little bit and usually catches the light. So typically the lower lip will be lighter than the upper lip. And right now I'm still just... Um, looking at the like the shadow shapes and and deciding where I need to put those in and then I decide I need to fill in the eye a little bit because sometimes sometimes I leave the eyes to, to like for the very last part and then sometimes if it looks creepy to me I'll fill it in so I guess I thought that that white eye just kind of looked 
sort of creepy. Actually, when I do my animal portraits, for whatever reason, I usually put their eyes in first. I guess it's like I want to make sure that they have life instilled in them from the very beginning. I don't know why it's opposite for humans for me, but anyhow, um, that's just the way that it is. So here I'm deepening that shadow right underneath the nose um, because the lighting source is coming from the right. You know, it hits the, usually it hits like the ball of the nose and that's where you're gonna get the brightest highlighted section. And then it, as it spills over the other side, it's kind of like this little cavern or, or crevice uh, right underneath the nose and right next to where the lips come out. And especially since this is kind of like a three quarter view, you're gonna get this, this kind of a, this is a really sort of formulary um, shadow. When you have a really bright, strong light source coming from the right. Um, and just so you guys know, I'm so excited today because I am using my brand new Blue Yeti, like, I guess it's a professional microphone. It looks really professional. And I'm using it for my my voiceovers now with my YouTube videos because I'm really trying to do more of these videos because um, I feel like I've finally gotten to a point, you know, like in my career where I want to start you know, sharing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a art educator anyway, so it, it makes sense for me to want to teach um, people or just to show people how I, I personally do my art. It's not to say that you have to do it the same exact way, but um, like I said in a previous video, I love watching art process videos from other artists. And I think, you know, I pick up tips or and techniques from other artists because I think it's it's really useful to include you know or just to you know support other artists by watching their work which I'm sure they've spent a long time you know refining and getting better at so yeah Uh, and then also because the light source is on the far right of her face, you know, those dark shadows are going to be farthest away from the light source. So that's why the, like the left side of her face, I mean, the view that we're looking at right now, on the left side of her face is going to be the, the darkest part. And then also, you know, the ear, because it is a, I mean, everything on the face is a three dimensional form. So... This is why I just, you know, you have to just look at it as if they, your face is built up off of all of these three dimensional shapes. And since the ear has the inside part of the ear, you know, that's where the darkest parts are going to be as well. So it's kind of like a little, like a little cup or a little bowl on the inside. Is that's where it's going to be darkest on the inside and the the light hits the edge or the top part of the ear because it's rounded it's they're kind of like little cylinder shapes right and then as the light bounces off of those um, three-dimensional shapes then it spills into sort of like a like I was saying before a little cavern or a little um, valley right it works the same kind of way it's kind of like you know the face is sort of like like an a, a very recognizable landscape i guess where you have you know mountains and valleys and plains and the light source is really really important and um so are values values is like getting, having an understanding of how value shifts are so important to illustrating your story. Like that is probably the most important lesson I would 
impart to anyone is to really try to, you know, figure that stuff out. And it just takes practice. Um, shading those, you know, really traditional organic shapes like the, you know, the sphere and the pyramid and the, you know, um, what else? The cylinder. Um, because I've done a lot of botanic illustration, I, I do, I started learning a lot about those shapes first. And that really, really helped me um, take a look at those shapes in, in all aspects of life because they're everywhere. And they're so, so important. It's like the top number one technique or lesson. I would probably, you know, explain that to, to anyone starting off in art is to get that down first because I think it's going to make everything else a lot easier. Plus, it'll make everything look better, too. Um, that little sh sheet of paper that I have under my hand is called glassine, and it's just like tracing paper. You could put a paper towel under there, um, or tracing paper is fine. I just have this, I have a lot of this glassine around because I do a lot of work with pastels, and glassine doesn't pick up the, the pastel. Like I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't really use a paper towel under my hand if I was going to do pastels because a paper towel would just absorb the pastel into it. So that's why I have this glass scene. Plus I like it because I can see through it. I can see, you know, I'm still looking at the relationship of other parts to the one part that I am like, you know, rendering right now. So that's why I like to be able to see underneath my hand and see what else is happening because I do tend to bounce around a lot and I know a lot of artists do that too. But I think it's a really nice like holistic way of looking at your at your drawing is not to just focus too much on one part um, because like for me you know like if I've completely fully rendered you know the eyes like let's say I, I decided I was going to just fill in this eye all the way um, and then later on some other part that I you know added color to or or added some detail to let's say it you know something was off and it was maybe the shape of the eye was wrong or the position um, so if I've already fully rendered it then that means it's going to take me a lot longer to fix fix my mistakes um, early on. So I usually, I mean, my, my, my technique, my process is sort of start with the bigger shapes and then work down to the smaller shapes and then even further details at the end. And that's pretty much how I work with most things. So yeah, right there at the hairline is going to be, that's also very dark because that's where the, you know, the light kind of gets, it bounces off of the forehead and then it kind of gets stuck underneath the lip of where the hair, hair starts because that's a, that's a three-dimensional form also. And then where the hair sort of like folds over kind of like a little bit of um what is that shape it's like rounded right it's it's like the back end of a of a cup so that's where the the light is going to hit that section and then as it goes back towards the back side of her hair you're going to get darker values back there so that's why it's really good to have darker values right at the the front part of where the hairline is and then you'll have some light in between that and then at the back you'll have another really dark value right that's gonna that's gonna illustrate curvature and form of the hair you know because hair I mean nothing on her her face head neck anything is flat it all has dimension and form 
and light and dark darkness value that's 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 what we're talking about that's what I'm talking about and that's what I hope you are you will pull away from this lesson is make sure you take a look at where the shadows are you know what actually helps me or helped me uh, and I actually still do it I actually do it every single time um, is I will look at my photo references um, I'll turn them into black and white and then you can really pop up the saturation of the um, the values there the dark and the light and that will really really help you visualize like where the different values are so yeah let's see continuing down here and you'll notice how some of these even though you know this these are all shadows like no no shadow is alike and no, no sections of the shadow are alike either. So there are some lighter values, darker values, um, and mid, mid tones. And then there's a whole bunch of shifts of value in between. But you know, this one, I left it pretty, pretty sketchy. I didn't, you know, I, I did not like fully render this like super duper realistically. Um, you know, it's really funny. This this drawing took me the least amount of time that uh, any drawing that I've ever done. Um, probably because I've been doing a lot of abstract work, and I feel like it's completely informing my um, when I do portraits now uh, because the abstractness is so much more fluid and you have to like respond a lot more quickly to what you're doing with the abstract work um i feel like i'm starting to kind of integrate some of those techniques into my portrait drawings so um it's actually really exciting to think that i can still evolve as a as an artist and use techniques from you know, my other parts of me, meaning the abstract art, um, and use those techniques and those lessons to sort of improve upon um, art in other aspects. Because I love to do animals, I love to do plants, and now I love to do landscapes. And the pastels also for me are really good because they don't let me be too tight or refined like the, because just because sorry because of the way that they are presented meaning in those in the stick forms I can't you know I can't get fine details with the pastels so yeah I think all these other mediums which are um what am I trying to say there? They are used in much different ways than like pencils and, you know, pens uh, and even paintbrushes. Because I can actually get really fine detail with paintbrushes as well. So I'm really, really happy that I decided to kind of step out and try to experiment with these other mediums because I, I feel like it's going to really help me, you know, let loose of that side of me that I spent so long refining but but don't get me wrong I still do love my color pencils oh yes I do and when it's it's something really deep and visceral when I pick up a color pencil wow my heart just sings and all I want to do is just scratch 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 and make things look really real but then you know like this is still technically a pencil but you can still get some pretty dynamic looks from this type of a medium too I think so yeah 
pretty cool. Art is just so cool. Uh, that little small eraser that I just used is called a click eraser and it's, um, it's a mono Tombow eraser. Let's see, mono, I'm sorry, mono zero. It is made by Tombow, but it's technically called a mono zero. It's really awesome for getting in, in between really small spaces. So yeah, don't forget about the shadow um, underneath the upper eyelid um, that gets um, cast onto the eyeball. Because the underneath the eyelids are just kind of like, they're like little mini rooftops. And you imagine any light source that gets um, bounced off the top of the roof. Well, guess what? The shadow is right underneath. Basically, right next to any shadow or any darker value, there's going to be a lighter value. And then right next to that lighter value, there's going to be another darker value. And that's what, you know, divides these sections into, you know, believable, believable parts. Right? Because if like her, if I had not done any shading to her face, it would just probably look like a sticker on the surface of this paper. But because I have identified, and actually it's only, it's mostly just because I've been looking at the, the photo reference, right? It helps me determine where these different shifts are. So, um, after I get this drawing done, which is, I'm pretty much, I'm getting very close to finishing this drawing. Um, I do decide to add a little bit of color to the background with some ink tense pencil. So that will be coming up in the next section. And I like to use a brush to brush away any pencil crumbs that build up. You don't want to use your hand to wipe away or swipe away any of those pencil crumbs because there's pigment in those pencil crumbs and they'll just get swiped right across your drawing and then you might have to cry. This is me using those, they're called soft tools, spelled S-O-F-F-T. I can link um, the these soft tools out in the description below. I find them incredibly useful for pastels and graphite. It's just, I just wanted to soften some of these, um, some of these shadow shapes down just a bit. I didn't want to completely erase all of the line work because it's really important to have diversity of line, shape, form, space, value, color, all of these things. These are super important. Even though this, um, this particular drawing really only has one, one color. And it's like, that's so pretty, like, bluish foresty green color. Okay, I'm getting close to the end and deciding what colors I want to use for my next section with the ink tents. All right, here we are. This is my this is my collection of water soluble pencils. It's watercolor pencils and ink tents and ink tents and watercolor pencils are two different products even though they are both water soluble anytime you see a little paintbrush on a pencil that means that 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 product is water soluble because some graphite is water soluble as well um so you see that said watercolor the watercolor pencils are not as vibrant as the ink tents those are my brushes i'm going to use a flat and a round, and then I think one of them is a filbert. Um, what was I going to say? So the ink tents are very, very vibrant once you bring water on top of it. So you'll see, and right now I'm just adding in the color, but you'll see once I put some water on top of this color, it's going to just jump right out at you. Um, and I, I could have added in more like, you know, shading and um, this kind of thing, other colors to her shirt, but I just left it just plain, just because I, you know, this was just, 
I didn't want to, um, I didn't want the focal point to be on that part of it. I wanted it to be more on her face. And you know, when you're thinking about adding in other art materials into the background, you want to make sure that it is a good pair with your the material that you've used for the main part of your subject. Meaning that because the pencils are so delicate, you want to add in if you're going to add in a background or add in something else to the subject, you want to make sure that it's a good match. Meaning that acrylic paint in the background would have been too overwhelming for this piece because my subject was rendered using a very delicate medium such as pencil. So watercolor and pencil and color pencil match really well because they're equally as delicate and they work a lot in the same way. Um, so here I am using, I just dipped some water, I dipped the paintbrush into the water. Um, I have to be really careful because the graphitint pencil that I use for the drawing of her face and head and stuff is also water soluble. So I have to that's why I'm trying to be really careful coming up right next to like the edge of her face and her hair because that would bleed into the ink tents. So here I'm trying to be super duper careful not to, um, you know, make the edge of her face bleed into where I'm putting down the, the magenta color. It's actually a fuchsia. It's called fuchsia. Um, so yeah, and then I'm going to, now I'm going to do the same with the yellow. I know, I remember, I think I remember where something happened and I, there was a little spot that got onto the, uh, some water spilled onto the magenta. And so then, you know, you have to decide if you're going to let your perfectionist side go, or if you're going to try to work with the work with the mistakes or the, I don't know, I don't really consider anything in art a mistake. I feel like it's either a lesson um, or it's just sort of like one of the pieces of the puzzle, like, okay, so that happened, so now how am I going to fix it? Usually with with wet medium, it's it's about letting that dry and then you can just go over the top of it with your same same medium and that's what I ended up doing because that one little spot you'll see it on the left side is a little bit it has a little white but I just I let that dry and then I went on top of it with more of the magenta and that was fine I decided to add in a little bit of a kind of a cool cool gray color to her eyes because I wanted her eyes to have a little little bit of color so and then I decided, oh, you know what? While I'm on this bluish color, maybe I'll just make it even more blue. Because you guys know me. If you follow me on Instagram, you will know that I love turquoise, neon pink, and yellow. Those are like my all-time favorite colors. So for me, it's like, it's a matter of adding in those colors somehow into my pieces, at least right now. So you see, I was able to sort of cover up that spot on the, on the magenta. And then, you know, usually the, the outside perimeter of the, of the iris is darker. And then the, the color of the eye the, the is a little bit lighter, typically. And then there's usually some, some reflected light on some parts of the, the iris of the eye. And then there's always a, like a highlight on the, usually on the pupil, or not always on the pupil, but there's a highlight somewhere on the, eyeball so make sure you include that because that just automatically 
adds life to your subject. Also with animal eyes, super duper important. Don't forget that. And here I decided to add in a little bit of the blue. Um, and that's also a reason why I, I added it. That's actually why I added in that blue. Um, oh, here I got a phone call in the middle of filming this from de my dentist who um, I was trying to reschedule some dental appointments. So that's what those little notes are to the right. So that's me and my daughter's um, dental appointments. <laughs> Anyways, the blue, I added in the blue to the background because I made her eyes a little bit blue and so that way you know we have a little bit of the same color in the background that we do and just a little bit of that in the foreground. Uh, plus I mean the graphitint that I used for her face has a it's like a little bluish green so you know it kind of works well with all that. That's the watercolor pencils so the watercolor pencil you'll see when I hit it with the water is not as bright and vibrant as the ink tents. And that's that's the difference between the watercolor and the ink tent. Also the ink tents is permanent. So you which is really cool. So you can go on top of the ink tents once it dries with any other medium and it's not gonna disturb or you know re wet. Um, any anything that has been put down with the ink tents that's going to stay put with the watercolor you, actually with the watercolor pencils it's it is harder to re-wet it um, but technically it it would if you hit it with some water some other water medium on top of the what anything watercolor there is a chance that it will um, re become, you know, it'll reignite with the with the water, and there's a chance that you could disturb that layer that you put down with the watercolor. Although with the watercolor pencils, I have found that it tends to stay put um, a lot better than just like traditional watercolors out of the tube or from a pan. That's just been my experience. But I don't really use watercolor pencils that much, actually. So, um, yeah, I just decided to use it because they were in the same container that my Inktense pencils were. Um, and this was like a little, the photo was of her looking into a, like one of those lit like those mirrors that has the like the circle light around it so that's what this this is supposed to illustrate so we're getting to the end of the video so i hope you guys liked watching me put together this drawing i had so much fun doing it and don't forget to hit the subscribe button which i am so proud of myself i figured out how to add a subscribe little icon in the lower right hand corner of all of my videos so don't forget to hit that subscribe button tell all your friends and I look forward to making many more of these videos with you all so thanks for watching and take care